Why don't we start with a prayer? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, as we reflect on the themes of grace, your grace to us in our lives, let us be mindful of that our true happiness ultimately lies in knowing and doing your will. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Well, welcome back. This is, we're celebrating anniversaries. So this is our fifth year anniversary of Summer School of Faith where I'm presenting. So we're old friends. It's another anniversary, as you'll see in our theme of our course. It's the 500th year anniversary of Martin Luther uh, posting those 95 theses on the door of a church starting the Protestant Reformation. It's also the 100th year anniversary of Fatima. Fatima. So we're celebrating several uh, anniversaries uh, this year. This year's theme is interesting because uh, Father Mike was kidding me about the title the other day about uh, Theology of Grace, God's Search for Man. And that sounded a bit uh, you know, exclusive of women. And, but there's a simple reason for that. <laughs> You're used to it. <laughs> well, there's another reason. <laughs> well, when you think about it, uh, when God made Adam, you know, he took one look at him and said, I can do better than that. <laughs> and he made Eve. So in some way, God has already been found by all women. So think of it that way. I'd also mention that the inspiration for this course, uh, for the overall framework of it, is a priest who passed away a couple years ago, Father Ed Oakes, who was a Jesuit who taught at St. Mary the Lake Seminary. And he died of pancreatic cancer. And uh, he wrote a book, uh, A Theology of Grace and Six Controversies, which I found very interesting and useful uh, to exploring the different themes of uh, grace. And he wrote the book while he was dying uh, of pancreatic cancer. And he had, in the introduction of the book, he mentioned he was at stage four. And uh, he was working quickly to uh, finish the book before he passed away, which he did uh, right before it was published. So this, in some way, is to honor his achievement of his life. I actually had him for a few courses at the seminary. Uh, and just a very... Uh, thoughtful professor there, so for Father Ed Oaks. If you look at the program itself, uh, these are the topics that we'll be covering uh, this summer over uh, five weeks. We will take a, a week off for the July 4th week, but the first topic is nature and grace, and that sounds academic, uh, that sounds a bit uh, esoteric, but as we get into it tonight, you'll see that it really provides a useful, helpful framework uh, for uh, the entire course. I mentioned the anniversary of Martin Luther, the 500-year anniversary. Uh, and we will explore what was that all about and how has that had implications up to today. Uh, and so we'll spend some time exploring that. The third uh, class is on evolution, genesis, uh, and what that means, and how can someone uh, who uh, accepts the science of evolution have that coexist with our faith uh, that we get, that we are created by God, uh, a human soul, and how can those things coexist together? Or how do they, in some ways, not coexist together? So that will be class number three. Class number four, grace in the spiritual life. We will touch ground a bit more about uh, the day-to-day -day living a spiritual life in grace. Now, uh, it's been said about me that it's questionable that I should even teach on the subject of the spiritual life. Uh, I have questionable credentials on this. Just ask my family. Uh, <laughs> but when I was uh, in the seminary my first year, I was assigned to a parish in Humboldt Park in Chicago, Immaculate Conception Parish, to learn Spanish. And that year that I was preaching there, the, it had the highest homicide rate in the country. Uh, and one time after Mass on Sunday, a, a violent uh, fight broke out uh, right in the street in front of the parish after uh, 
I had given a homily, and the pastor looked over at me as there was this scrum of people fighting, and he said to me, Charles, is there anything you'd like to add? <laughs> and uh, so if you feel like you want to strike your neighbor after listening to me, you can say in confession that it was what Charles was talking about. So I will labor through this topic. Fortunately, I can rest on the shoulders of the saints who, uh, who do this much better than I do. And then the last is really uh, no subject of grace or conversation about it would be complete without talking about the Blessed Mother and her role, uh, not only in the economy of salvation, but almost as a unifying figure for all Christian faiths. I know that sounds odd and unusual because the Marian dogmas, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception or the Assumption, uh, tend to make Protestants uncomfortable because they're, in their view, unscriptural or non-scriptural. But if we look at this from a different perspective, we might see that Mary actually uh, is a way of uniting the different Christian faiths, and we'll go through what that looks like and what that means. So that's, that's the course uh, overall for the summer, and I, I, I think you'll be interested in, in uh, what we go through. So continuing, uh, let's begin our, our first topic tonight, which is nature and grace, and, and really the whole topic of a theology of grace. Typically, when this is taught in the seminary, it's part of the core curriculum because it's so fundamental. And our Catholic heritage, our history of theology, presents many, many different concepts and ideas, and it all sounds kind of uh, academic and jargon, and it can be a bit overwhelming. So where begin? And Father Oaks, in his book, really poses the same question. Where where begin this broad topic of God's grace? Uh, and there's two uh, elements of what makes this such a broad topic, and, and where should we begin? One is simply the mystery of God's action in the world. It's a mysterious God. Uh, this conflict we see between good and evil, uh, truth and falsehood, uh, the swirl, the whirlwind of the interaction of all that. Not only is God's action in the world mysterious, but we are a mystery in many ways to ourselves. So you layer these two components of our wonderful aspirations, our, our fantastic ability to do, to do tremendous things, as well as our ability for self-destruction and our inhumanity to others. You layer these two things together, and it's a very difficult topic to even begin. And so what interestingly, uh, Father Oaks begins with a figure from history that is actually a, an important figure, uh, a man named Boethius, who lived uh, in the fifth and early sixth century. Boethius was a probably the, one of the more educated people of his time. He was an advisor to the Ostrogothic emperor uh, Theodoric. And Theodoric was a visit, an Ostrogoth, which was the eastern group of barbarians who raided through uh, Europe and uh, parts of what's today southeastern Germany, and also took over Italy eventually. He was an Arian by nature, whereas Boethius was an Orthodox uh, Catholic theologian and thinker. Well, he was caught up in a palace intrigue with the emperor. He was actually tutor to the emperor for a while and then was suspected of collaborating with the eastern emperor in the east, Justinian, and was eventually caught up uh, in this intrigue and his enemies were able to sentence him to death. They accused him of colluding with the Russians. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> But kidding aside, he was sentenced to death and w wrote this work in jail, awaiting death. He was actually bludgeoned to death. And uh, he wrote this book almost like the way the book of Job reads in a lot of ways. And it's interesting to start the whole conversation of grace from a man who was probably one of the best educated men of his time, a counselor to the emperor, was then awaiting a sham trial that was going to find him guilty, and he knew he was going to die. 
And so this is, in effect, a kind of jailhouse diary. Uh, and I couldn't help thinking that Father Ed, who was dying also when he wrote the book I referred to earlier, there's a certain parallel and a certain poignancy about it. So the work is very famous in the Western canon, The Consolation of Philosophy. It's a text that Thomas Aquinas also quotes from in the Summa and other works. And uh, he starts a dialogue with what he calls Lady Philosophy. And Lady Philosophy is this mystical figure who visits him while he's in prison. But I thought it would be a very interesting way to start the conversation about God, the human person, grace, and uh, our, our capacity for isolation and self-destruction. So let me read the, the, the opening of this book, and it's in, largely it's in uh, four chapters. So here's Boethius, basically rotting in jail, been abandoned by everyone, and, and he writes as follows. I, who once composed with eager zest, am driven by grief to shelter in sad songs, all torn the muse's cheeks who spell the words for elegies that wet my face with tears. No terror could discourage them at least from coming with me on my way. They were the glory of my happy youth, and still they comfort me in hapless age. Old age came suddenly by suffering sped, and grief then bade her government begin. I, a worn out bone bag, hung with flesh. Death would be happy if it spared the glad, but heeded invocations from the wretch. But now death's ears are deaf to hopeless cries. His hands refuse to close poor weeping eyes. First fickle fortune gave me wealth, short-lived, then in a moment all but ruined me. Since fortune changed her trustless countenance, small welcome to the day's prolonging life. Foolish the friends who called me happy then, whose fall shows how my foothold was unsure. Yeah. Reads a lot like the book of Job, doesn't it? Yeah. Turning the page, and this goes on for several books, by the way. But don't worry, I read it so you don't have to. Uh, he finally has an encounter with Lady Philosophy. And what's interesting is commentators note this. And they said, how, how come a Catholic who's suffering in jail and facing death, why does he invoke Lady Philosophy? Jesus Christ is never mentioned in this work, ever. And no theological Christian themes are ever mentioned in this work. And a commentator, sometimes some of them think that, well, he's, he's politicking now. He's trying to show that he's a good pagan. Maybe he will get off, which doesn't speak well for Boethius, but it did give us a tremendous work of philosophy. You note the title is Consolation of Philosophy, not the Consolation of Christ. So maybe we're in this time of the 5th century and the 6th century where the pagan grip on society, on culture, is still there, uh, even in a figure like Boethius. But finally, we get to the end in Book 4, Chapter 6, and he's continuing this lament. Why this is all turned upside down? Why good men are oppressed by punishments reserved for crime, and bad men can snatch the rewards that belong to virtue? Surprises me very much. And I would like to know from you, Lady Philosophy, the reason for this very unjust confusion. I would be less surprised if I could believe that the confusion of things is due to fortuitous operations of chance. But my wonder is only increased by the knowledge that the ruling power of the universe is God. Sometimes he is pleasant to the good and unpleasant to the bad, and other times he grants the bad their wishes and denies the good. But since he often varies between these two alternatives, what grounds are there for distinguishing between God and the haphazard of chance. So Lady Philosophy, she paused and smiled a moment before answering. You are urging me to the greatest of all questions, a question that can never be exhausted. The subject is of such a kind that when one doubt has been removed, countless others spring up in its place like the hydra's head. The only way to check them is with a real lively intellectual fire. 
I, I should stop, and this is an allusion to something that would have been in the popular imagination of the time, and, and perhaps some of you have read The Trials of Hercules when you were in school. Uh, well, one of the trials that Hercules had to uh, perform was fighting the Hydra, who was protecting the Golden Fleece. It wasn't just Jason and the Argonauts. Uh, and so what Hercules found is every time he cut off the head of one of the snakes, two more grew. And so he realized the only way he could overcome the Hydra was as soon as he cut a head off, cauterize it with a torch. And that's how he killed the Hydra. And so this allusion to the Hydra heads of problems that come up when we talk about God's providence and free will or sufficient grace and yet are all saved. These problems mount and mount the more we think about human freedom and the freedom to refuse God's initiative. So these countless problems that plague Protestant theology of predestination uh, of the damned, if you're uh, John Calvin and the Calvinists, or Martin Luther. So in Boethius, we have this recognition that these questions are deep, and they generate more questions the more uh, talking we do about them. So the usual subjects of inquiry concern the oneness of providence, the course of fate, the haphazard nature of random events of chance, divine knowledge and predestination, and the freedom of the will. You can see for yourself how difficult they are. So there's a paradox at the root of this already that Boethius is calling out. Interestingly, if we look at one other poem about the paradox of man, uh, Alexander Pope, by the way, I should mention, is the second most frequently quoted uh, author in the Oxford English Dictionary after Shakespeare. A lot of people don't realize that, but Alexander Pope was probably in the top three of the greatest poets of the English language and, and doesn't often get his recognition, so we're giving him some here. Uh, but some of you know this poem, I, I believe, or you'll know phrases from it. Know then thyself, presume not God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. Placed on this isthmus of middle state, a being darkly wise and rudely great, with too much knowledge for the skeptic pride, for the skeptic side, with too much weakness for the stoic's pride. He hangs between in doubt to act or rest, in doubt to deem himself a god or beast, in doubt his mind or body prefer born to die and reasoning to err. Alike in ignorance, his reason such, whether he thinks too little or too much. Chaos of thought and passion all confused, still by himself abused or disabused, created half to rise and half to fall. Great Lord of all things, yet a prey to all. Sole judge of truth in endless error hurled, the glory jest and riddle of the world. It's a very famous poem, and you will find uh, sections of this in different uh, seals or mottos uh, all across Europe. So this is kind of the background of, of where begin? Where begin a theology of grace, given the unknowability of God's action in the world versus the haphazard randomness of chance, of the fact that that human beings, the human person contains wonderful potentials for virtue and incredibly awful and toxic ways of acting in evil ways. This incredible range of capability the human person has that we actually don't see in the animal kingdom. Uh, we, it's unique to being a human being that we can do wonderful things and we can do terrible things. And the theology of grace sweeps up all of these uh, layers that we're about to talk about. So if you look now, we get to our subject tonight. <laughs> but you can see why a theology of grace treats what's most fundamental. It's the most fundamental thing in theology because every topic in theology has a theology of grace implicit in it. If we're talking about the Trinity, we just had Trinity Sunday, and we say quickly, three persons, one nature, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But that's already uh, laying with terminology uh, that generates that understanding. 
Or think of the Christology of the first four or five centuries of the church, where the, the debate was, how is Jesus God and human? And, and that resolution at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD was, Jesus Christ is one person, the second person of the Trinity, in two natures, a divine and human nature. But you see the interplay of grace and nature is at work there already in our understanding. Think of the sacraments. The sacraments are the union of the physical and the spiritual. So if you think about the sacraments, uh, you know, a, a word is a sacrament of sorts. You have the audible sound of my voice, and that's the physical side. You have the spiritual side, which is the meaning of what I'm saying. All sacraments participate in this nature grace uh, dichotomy, baptism. We see water, it's a sign of cleansing, and the invisible communication of that person being baptized as a child of God with a real new determination, a real new characteristic. So all theology participates in this fundamental topic of the theology of grace. And this all sounds academic, doesn't it? But realize this was society dividing and church dividing in the 16th century, and even before then. But it was crucial to how society eventually was formed and how human people, human beings, understood themselves in relationship to that grace. And we will get into that more. But just to bring this down to the ground, because some of you, I know, might be thinking, Charles, you always do this. You lead us on this academic journey, and we want some breadcrumbs to bring us back. Think about today. In your own experience, I know this is true because it's true in mine, the Catholic approach and a contemporary secular approach. The Catholic understanding is that Jesus Christ is the exclusive mediator of all graces to the world. There is no name under heaven or on earth other than that name by which we are saved. Everything that went before Jesus points to Jesus, and everything that comes after Jesus points back to him. What's the contemporary understanding today? Well, Jesus is a wonderful historical figure, a good man, but one of many historical figures who appears on the stage of history and says nice things that can inspire us. But let's not get too excited about this because as we know from the slogan, religion divides people and the spirit unites. And after all, isn't it about this ill-defined spirit that we're all seeking. So that's an obvious example that I think you all would recognize. Jesus is not the exclusive mediator of all grace. Obviously, he's a wonderful figure, but uh, religion divides. So any claims of exclusivity, of being God's mediator, is arrogant. That's that's the impression today in our contemporary secular culture. That's an example of a theology of grace in operation. Another one, the sacraments. As Catholics, we believe sacraments have a certain intensity about them, each of the seven. We believe receiving the Eucharist is really and truly receiving the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. It's not symbolic. It's not a walk in the woods. That conflicts with the uh, contemporary understanding that, well, grace is everywhere available. And to try to locate it in a special way in the sacraments sounds a bit snobby. And uh, of course, as Catholics, we do believe that grace is available to all of us everywhere, anytime, in any circumstance. But that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about the sacraments. We're talking about signs that were instituted by Christ to give grace of a special uh, strength and a special character that is not just generally available, it conflicts with the contemporary understanding that's uh, in the air today in our culture. Last one, and this is popular in the self-help books and, and other things, uh, but it's probably the issue in the culture today. Namely, 
what does Christian discipleship mean versus the search for self? So Christian discipleship means following Christ wherever that leads, picking up our cross, self-denial, in order to experience a kind of liberation of self in Christ. <laughs> True Christian freedom, the freedom to love. The contemporary understanding is self-discovery as an end in itself, and that I will pick and choose from the buffet of religions and other uh, environmental uh, things to further my self-exploration. The sovereign self is what it's called. And it's a, a kind of low-grade form of atheism, that I'm looking at God in the mirror every morning. And so this is what's going on in the culture today, is that certainly Jesus Christ is a good role model for how I discover myself. But Jesus is not the goal. Appropriating Christ into my life is not the goal. Rather, it's how can I use Jesus to further my own self-discovery? And if Jesus ever talked about yoga in the New Testament, that would finish the whole thing. So um, you can see how our theologies of grace are operative every day, and we don't even realize it. So not so academic anymore, is it? How many of you, uh, certainly not in my family, but how many of you have nieces and nephews who um, didn't marry in the church? Or sons and daughters who uh, don't go to Mass? Uh, and I'm not blaming anyone, don't get me wrong, this is widespread. Uh, uh, who just blow it off? Uh, because they're operating from a theology of grace that I'm talking about. Uh, and this, this claim that Jesus Christ makes on us of exclusivity strikes us in the general culture as a bit overdone, a, a bit uh, too pigeonholed for our tastes. But that's precisely uh, what Christian discipleship ultimately means. So these are examples of, uh, there are many others we could talk about. But let's, we now need a framework uh, to discuss this more uh, intelligently. Before we get to this framework, are there any comments or questions so far? Okay. Well, we'll keep the wine over here then, just in case. Uh, okay. But this is classic uh, theology of grace uh, terminology. And to talk about nature and grace, we should define our terms. So nature is a word from Latin, uh, and it really means, it comes from a verb to be born. Uh, so our word nativity uh, comes from uh, that Latin root. Uh, but it refers to what is essential to something. The nature of something means what characterizes it in its substance, in its essence. It's not something incidental. It's not something fly by night. It, your nature, human nature, the nature of a dog, uh, the nature of electricity. This is what's inherent in a thing as that kind of thing. It's what characterizes it to be what it is. And that's nature. So we all have a human nature. Now, the other uh, word, grace, comes from a Latin word, gratia, uh, and a verb which means to give thanks. And we can see this in our own English language. Grace, gratuity, it, if, if a dancer has grace, style and grace, it makes them pleasing to watch. Uh, a gratuity in a restaurant is something above and beyond what was owed. Uh, so you can all think of examples of grace, but it's something that wasn't essential. Maybe it was something, a pleasant surprise, or it makes you pleasing to another. And so grace, you can see, is something just in the normal course of theological terminology and philosophy, is something above and added to nature. It, in some ways, it makes it more pleasing than what it is just left to itself. Let's turn to sacred scripture to put a little more uh, logs on the fire here because some problems are going to come about now that we get from sacred scripture in the New Testament. And don't worry, I will read this to you. It can be small print. But how does the New Testament, for example, talk about nature and grace? So our first entry is from Paul's letter to the Colossians, this beautiful opening uh, in this letter 
uh, chapter 1, he's referring to Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Isn't that an interesting expression about who Jesus is? Firstborn of all creation? I thought he was born in approximately 1 AD. Now, they didn't have the calendars at that time. Do we switch over yet? But uh, firstborn of all creation? Everything was created through Jesus Christ? Are we in Genesis? What is this all about? Or the Gospel of John, first chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. I could cite other passages, for example, from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, or other areas in the Bible that talk about Jesus Christ and this original continuity, this original relationship Jesus Christ has with the created order. There's a congeniality about it. There was a oneness there at the beginning. You see what's being developed here. And so uh, there is this friendship between grace and nature from the beginning in Jesus Christ. And in fact, all reality is what I call Christocentric. All reality already bears the marks of Jesus Christ in a mysterious way. This is going to conflict sharply with other parts of Paul, as we will see. So in the letter to the Ephesians, And you he made alive when you were dead, through the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So like today, people were chasing after different spirits and fads and things. Among these, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of body and mind. And so we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of that great love which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So, now we have language about left to ourselves, we're dead. We have no relationship to God. We are children of disobedience. We are cut off. See what's emerging here? A, a different vision. And if we look at the first letter to Corinthians, 15 chapter, it's even more stark. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. We, we just read in the other passages that it was wonderful. Uh, everything was made from Christ. But now, that's not being emphasized. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there's also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual which is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so those are who are of dust, and is the man of heaven. So are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. And then he wraps up this section. I tell you this, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. No continuity, no connection. Lo, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised and perishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable nature must be on the imperishable, and this mortal nature must be put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. 
O death, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? You see, what's being developed there is the incompatibility of nature and grace. Nature left to itself is dead, incapable of a higher life. It requires grace, Jesus Christ, the imperishable, the immortal, to rescue what is lost, what has been cut off. So there's a paradox at work here. Some passages talk about the continuity of nature and grace, and other passages show this stark opposition that we are at war with what's spiritual. So this, this is frames, in a lot of ways, uh, this issue. Now, this is not in your packet because I didn't want to drain all of the inkjet from the parish office, but the next few slides um, are not in your deck, but they can be made available to you. But let me ask the group a question. Would Jesus Christ have come if Adam had not sinned? There, there is. Now, we all were trained um, in the, what I'll call the classical view of, which really comes from St. Anselm, which is the satisfaction theory of redemption. Namely, that Jesus came to save us from our sins, which we would have believed in either approach, uh, but he came to repay a debt that was owed from the sin of disobedience of Adam. We were all generally uh, trained this way. And uh, it's correct. Uh, and it predominated because it came from St. Anselm in the 11th century and into the 12th century. Namely, this theory of satisfaction, that Jesus Christ satisfies the anger of the Father who uh, can justly condemn us to life without him unless someone comes who can offer perfect reconciliation, who is both God and man, namely Jesus Christ. This is the classical uh, spirituality and theology of the church for uh, a significant portion. And it's something that uh, would answer the question, as Aquinas did all throughout his writings, that the only time Christ is referred to in the New Testament and foretold in the Old is to save us from our sins. So Aquinas, who influenced most of theology after him, would say that God could have done anything he wanted to do to save us. But he sent his only son to take a human nature uh, to save us from our sins, and that's the only way it's referred to in Scripture. Now, we've seen some passages that hint at some, another understanding, but that is the dominant and correct uh, theology of our redemption. But there is another school uh, in the history of the church, the Franciscan, Franciscan school, and uh, Dun Scotus, who's now blessed Dun Scotus, was a Franciscan theologian toward the end of the uh, uh, 13th century, uh, and St. Bonaventure came after him. What do they emphasize? They emphasized the fact that Christ would have come regardless. The primacy of Christ. And this is interesting because there is, as we saw, some scriptural support for it. But that uh, creation, all creation, nature and or grace, is first and foremost an act of love, of God. And in that single act of love, God didn't wait to see, will Adam obey or disobey? And if he disobeys, then I'm going to send Jesus Christ. Bonaventure thought that was bizarre that what is lower would cause what is higher. Why would the disobedience of Adam be the cause of the glory of the incarnation, which is the greatest expression of creation? Nature's first solitary boast, as the poet put it, but nature's sole solitary boast was the Blessed Virgin Mary. But this point of view is the cosmic Christ, that he would have been sent regardless because the goodness of creation required it. And that the lower 
the sin of disobedience doesn't cause the higher, the, the beauty and grace of the incarnation. So these two views, the church has never uh, negotiated or resolved and allows them to coexist, and I'm glad she does, because there's a beautiful spirituality in that as well. Both views, of course, understand that Jesus came to save us from our sins. But the question that is in the middle of this is, would have Jesus come anyway? It's interesting to think about, and in some ways it can help uh, our prayer life as well. One of the expressions from Eastern uh, theology and philosophy is the reference to Jesus' Pantocrator, and some of you, if you've toured uh, cathedrals in Europe and seen Gothic architecture of churches, you will have seen this cosmic Christ uh, above the tabernacle in these churches. And it has a very interesting origin that we lose sight of. And the reason why I'm spending some time on this is, is panto is a Greek prefix meaning everything, universal. At the beginning, in the middle, and the end. And a Krator actually referred to the Olympic Games in Greece where they had matches among what were then Greek gladiators where they'd be in competitions and would often fight to the death. So imagine using that expression that Jesus Christ has conquered and fought and killed every power and principality in the universe. Of course he was coming regardless because everything is placed beneath his feet, including the sins of Adam and our sins. All creation, the entire universe, all universes are at Christ's feet. He has conquered, he has destroyed everything. And so I, another reason I didn't print this out is this is a uh, cathedral in Palermo, Sicily. And it's, a, it's probably one of the better examples not only of, of, not to go too far into this, Norman Gothic architecture, but you see at the center uh, the Ponto Crator. And you see this in many different cathedrals throughout Europe. And if, if I was to do a, a larger blow, look at that image in relation to everything else. And uh, it was built over many years in the 12th century, but you see the theology behind that as well. And it's, it's, it appears to be more of a Franciscan influence when you, when you think about it. So you can see how the nature of grace question is now starting to take a little more shape. You know, it started out in a very broad net, and now we're starting to, we know what nature and grace now means. We know some of the different theologies, the Franciscan school, and the fact that Thomas Aquinas actually held a different view uh, along with St. Anselm. The other interesting thing that was in the deck that I'll mention, it was for Bonaventure and Duns Scotus, it was immediately obvious to them that Mary had to be immaculately conceived, coming out of that Franciscan school of theology. And yet Thomas Aquinas didn't believe that. And in fact, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception probably would have been defined at the Council of Trent in the 16th century, but the influence of Aquinas was so significant that the council fathers in Trent didn't do it, but they wanted to. Just a little uh, historical note, if your Protestant friends say, well, that was just a 19th century invention or a, a later invention. It was actually something, part of the piety and belief of the church for a very long time. But the influence of Aquinas was so significant that people were reluctant to advance that. But the main point I wanted to make was it was obvious to St. Bonaventure that it was a direct implication of the Panto Crator, the cosmic Christ, that to gain a toehold into what is finite and small would hinge on the yes of a woman. His door into the universe was through the consent of a woman which would have just completely flipped the table over of, of the culture of the time, where uh, the Greek gods often conceived their offspring in violence, 
and uh, not by consent. So let's return to our theme of this paradox. So we're back in the deck. So grace is this, in the classical understanding, a dwelling in the soul, and it fulfills our deepest aspirations and possibilities now and for eternal life. It's a gift of God. We're not entitled to it, and yet it's the most fulfilling thing we could possibly possess. You see the the paradox that will bother thinkers later on how can God command what he has not provided in justice? How can God call me to a life and not give me the means to achieve it? Or so it goes. As Augustine said, grace is in us, but not of us. Another aspect of the paradox. And Aquinas will talk about this, and this is where our our two-tier uh, theology comes from in the Baltimore Catechism of grace building on nature. Uh, the final good of man is twofold. One is in proportion to human nature, a kind of natural end. The other is a good that exceeds this proportion, since the forces of nature are not sufficient to attain it or even think about it or desire it. This is eternal life, which is promised to man solely by divine generosity. You see, he's in the discontinuity camp and that Jesus only comes to save us from our sins. Now, this building block, I call it imagery of nature as one brick and grace as the next brick on top of it is in the Baltimore Catechism. You might recall the, the child walking with a, a, a gift of nature and then on top is a box called grace. And it's in the section right before the sacraments talking about how grace builds on nature. And that is, again, the classical formulation that we were all instructed in, if you were instructed by the Baltimore Catechism. You see what's going on. <laughs> but there are some drawbacks to this. And then before we uh, go further, we'll open up for a few questions. <clears throat> so the Catholic position which we will contrast with the Protestant position next class, uh, is grace is first and foremost a gift to us and is the life and power of God in the soul. So far, so good. All Protestants and Catholics agree on that. Here's where it gets different between Catholics and Protestants. As Catholics, we believe our nature is wounded by original sin and by the sins we commit. That we fight against Earth's gravity in trying to do good. We're constantly at war with ourselves and with our external circumstances. And we are walking against the current often uh, to do good and to live a life of grace. But we can be sanctified by grace. We can be made whole. We can be healed, really and truly in our nature. So what is wounded and on some level corrupt can be rejuvenated, can be, be invigorated. This conflicts, as we will see in next class, with the Protestant understanding that for Luther, for example, and we'll get to this later, that nature isn't restored as much as it's covered over by Christ's righteousness. And the image he uses, which I'll use uh, a few more times, is human nature is like a dung heap, rotting, putrid, disgusting, capable only of sin and crime. And God's grace covers it over like snow on a dung heap and makes it look good and righteous. But there is no internal rejuvenation, truly. So we will get to that. But this architectural model, this two-tier model of grace building on nature did tend in the, in the history of the church to make people think that grace was restricted to holy moments or going to mass on Sunday, uh, specialized occasions. Uh, and that isn't healthy uh, because as we know, uh, certainly the sacraments are privileged moments of grace and doors to the sacred, uh, 
But grace is available to us everywhere and anywhere in the circumstances of our life. But there was a tendency in classical theology to restrict grace to these moments disconnected from our daily life. But what I wanted to uh, emphasize here is that grace is existential. It's real. It truly touches us in our nature. We are truly sanctified. We are truly made pleasing. And most importantly, we make real contact with God. True union with God. People wouldn't have to go to yoga class every morning to achieve this union if they knew Christianity provides this avenue. But we've, we, in some ways, we, we've stopped talking about the fact that union with God, real contact with God, is the whole purpose of our spiritual life. And then that union transforms us through the virtues where we think and act in a way that we normally wouldn't. So I, I want to emphasize that because it does conflict with the Protestant understanding as well as uh, what's in the air today of what maybe church leaders uh, spend their time on versus this topic. Are there any questions before I go to the final section? Yes. I would distinguish the second person of the Trinity from Jesus Christ who took a human nature in the sense that the Trinity existed forever in, in all time and eternity. Jesus Christ, second person of the Trinity, assumes a human nature in time. That's the difference. Yes. It is. So the question is, I thought the Pantocrator was an Eastern Orthodox concept, and it certainly is. Uh, what's interesting is the influence in the trading routes of east to west, particularly in Venice and the southern parts of Italy and Sicily, you see that architecture already in the 12th century. So a lot of that cross-pollination occurred, obviously, by the, the intercourse between uh, theologians in both countries, but also the trading that would occur between Italy and the east. So they, they, this did not happen in isolation. And what, what's interesting is that art is so beautiful uh, in the East that even the Western churches and Gothic cathedrals adopted it. But it adopted the implicit theology that was behind it, too. And we'll touch on that a bit uh, later about the Eastern approach to this theology of grace. I want to introduce another. Oh, yes. That's an interesting question. And. The, the, the reality, though, is that uh, in this one act of creation where God, uh, and this becomes difficult to speak of, uh, everything is captured in that glance, if you will. So there is no, uh, the causality, because we're in time, is we think Adam sinned in this particular understanding. Je uh, God noticed that and thought, well, I'm going to send Jesus now. And that's our temporal, time-based, finite way of thinking about it. But if in God's eternal now, if you will, uh, out of the love of his, of his being creates, he creates all of the aspects in that one uh, action. So the action of grace is creation, our freedom, and our freedom implies then the freedom to disobey and the perfection of creation, which is Jesus Christ. So... The, the challenge for us is, and this is why it's a paradox and a mystery of faith, is how do we, how do we sort that out? What John <laughs> asked about, how does this fit in with the doctrine of justification, which will be class two, and actual and sanctifying grace, which are terms in theology of grace that are useful and helpful for understanding. Let me introduce you in the time we have left to a household name. So Matthias Shabin uh, doesn't get a lot of press these days. Uh, he, he, he's actually not very well known in theological circles, but he's making a comeback. I'm trying to help him here. <laughs> but a very interesting forward-looking uh, thinker, a bit of a child prodigy. He had two doctoral degrees 
by the time he was 23 in philosophy and theology, uh, became a priest, uh, taught dogmatic theology in, in Germany, uh, and had a interesting and what I think contemporary take on this entire subject, which is how we'll, we'll, we'll bring things uh, to a conclusion. But he was dissatisfied with, with the church's formulation of the nature of grace, distinction, everything we've been talking about. Because he felt like it, it, it promoted uh, spiritualities in the culture that were restricting grace to just holy moments only. And he emphasized the fact that when we get into the theology of justification and this preoccupation we have with our salvation, good works, grace, freedom, God's foreknowledge, he says all that is missing the point of what first has been accomplished by Jesus Christ. So he's going to emphasize the supernatural nature of Christianity. He will certainly embrace the distinction between nature and grace. Nature is incapable of a spiritual life left to itself. We need God's grace, and God's grace is entirely a gift. But he's going to say that if you get preoccupied with your salvation, not that you shouldn't be interested in that, but you will miss what Jesus is actually doing in your life and what he actually accomplished. And that we are called to living with God, a real union, in a very radical way. And so what I'd like to do is read you a few quotations from a few of his works, and, and I will be concise and brief with this. So keep in mind he's writing in the 19th century, probably around somewhere around 1870. Uh, Europe is in the height of, of this rationalism coming out of Kant, Immanuel Kant and, and Hegel. Europe is largely becoming secular in its radical forms. We've just gone through the French Revolution, which was kind of one large uh, holocaust uh, by agnostics and atheists, regardless of what you're taught in, in high school about the French Revolution being this wonderful liberating act. Uh, in fact, it was uh, devastating to the Catholic Church and the crimes against humanity uh, were as awful as anything that's ever happened anywhere. Uh, and so, uh, that's the milieu he is writing in, uh, and you can, I, we don't have time to spend what was going on in Germany in this time, but similar themes. My cherished aim is to bring out the supernatural character of the Christian economy of salvation in its full sublimity, beauty, and riches. The main task of our time, it seems to me, consists in propounding and emphasizing the supernatural character of Christianity for the benefit of both science and life. Theoretical as well as practical naturalism, matters all there is, there's no spiritual realities, and rationalism, basically the mind cannot know objective reality, which seek to throttle and destroy all that is specifically Christian must be resolutely and energetically repudiated. And in another work, thus the incarnation of the Son of God is the real basis for the adoption of the human race and likewise conducts that adoption to a consummation that is unique in its sublimity. This fatherhood is not merely imitated in God's relationship to man out of sheer grace, but is joined to man substantially. The incarnation raises the human race to the bosom of the eternal father, that it may receive the grace of sonship with all of its implied dignities and rights by a real contact with the source rather than by a purely gratuitous influx from without. So you see he's attacking that brick on brick, nature, grace, theology that is prevalent in the church. He's not just speaking metaphorically. Uh, we are substantially related to the Trinity. And he's gonna go on uh, and, and, and make this even more radical. In the next page, because of Christ, this sonship is no longer a mere adoptive sonship, since we receive it not as strangers, but as kinfolk. It's a translation of a German word. As members of the only begotten Son, and can lay claim to it as a right. 
The grace of sonship in us has something of the natural sonship of Christ himself from which it is derived. Because we are not mere adoptive children, because we are members of the natural son, we truly enter into personal relationship in which the son of God stands to his father. In literal truth and not by simple analogy or resemblance, we call the father of the word our father. And in actual fact, he is such not by purely analogous relationship, but by the very same relationship which makes him the father of Christ. This is a very uh, interesting radical, and he's walking the line of orthodoxy because obviously we don't relate to the father the way the second person of the Trinity relates to the father uh, by the essence that they share. But he is saying the same thing that makes Jesus Christ, Son of God, Son of Mary, that graced relationship to his humanity, is available to us. Not by mere adoption, not by analogy, not by some vague resemblance, but in fact, it is the very same thing, the very same relationship. Very provocative. I, I add here that isn't this what makes Christianity incredible, attractive, beautiful, in addition to being true, that we are called to the same union with God the Father that Jesus Christ possessed in his humanity? And he goes on. And this is, quite frankly, true in our day. How poverty-stricken and mean Christian morality appears when it is regarded merely as the morality of man. That is, the ethics based on man's natural moral dignity as found in his reason and free will. Rather than as the morality of the sons of God. To grasp the truth that we are really Christ's brothers, we must go into the question of our conformity with him in his divine, no less than in his human nature. And grace may not be regarded merely as a corroborating factor in moral life. It must be apprehended and presented as the new foundation of that life, pertaining to a higher order. Then we shall develop a true moral theology as distinct from moral philosophy. Then we shall be able to preach from the pulpit a morality that shares in the excellence of dogmatic theology, a morality rooted in faith, grace, and the mysteries of Christianity. <laughs> other parts of the work, he fights against this, this problem of reducing Christianity to morality. Of course Christianity implies morality. But to reduce it to that is to miss what the incarnation achieved, namely the possibility of this real union with God. Now, of course, that is enabled by Christian living. But that's the whole purpose of the incarnation. Access to God in a, in a very vivid and direct way. So let's talk about implications as we, as we bring things to a close. I'll use the term pastoral accompaniment. That seems to be in vogue these days. Um, but if you're like me, um, we've all been in conversations with people, maybe at work or people we meet at a party who uh, it comes out in the conversation that they are living a non-Christian lifestyle in a very uh, radical way. Um, maybe you are at a party and you meet a, a couple uh, that are living together uh, and they're not married. Uh, and not that you would dwell on this at a party at all, but suppose the question comes up somehow uh, about faith and Christianity uh, do you start with you're violating the Sixth and Ninth Commandments if you were interested in attracting them <laughs> back to church? You, you wouldn't. If, if you had a moment with them privately and they were interested, often hard at a party, um, you'd start with, I think, what has Jesus accomplished? What did the incarnation achieve? And it's what Shaban is talking about, this ability to achieve a real union with God. And you would talk about that. How, 
how the Old Testament, the history of the Old Testament, that culminates in Christ's coming and that Christ seeks us out. Once people see the attractiveness of that, then there are implications. But what Shaban was talking about is we tend to get stuck on morality and it appears mean. Think, think about it this way. If, we're, if you think of the issues of the day, uh, gay people, uh, in some level, have a legitimate gripe. In that why is the church picking on us? Y- you haven't talked about marital chastity in 40 years between heterosexuals, so why are you now holding the line on us? You see how, uh, how because the church hasn't talked about the attractiveness of Christianity and what Jesus Christ has accomplished enough, and how that then connects to Christian living, we never get to Christian living anymore. Because why do it? (laughs) It's hard. And more to the point, when you want to evangelize people who are living a lifestyle of some kind or another that is unchristian, how make that attractive to them? If you start with morality, in isolation from what Jesus Christ has accomplished in the incarnation, death and resurrection, It's not attractive. Real union with God is the headline. Then we can talk about how we achieve that in the spiritual life and Christian living. We we have a tendency also in the classical theology, not that it's necessary, but it has tended to be this way, to think that virtuous living is all about a favorable credit balance in the afterlife. And, of course, we should be concerned with the afterlife. But Jesus offers that to us right now. And we can choose to create a heaven on earth right now or a hell on earth right now. And really what happens when we die is God merely gives us the choice of our actions in this life. If you created a hell for yourself and others in this life, God's not going to interrupt that. It starts right now. So you see, morality then is sanctified living. Living out what Jesus has accomplished. So coming attractions for future classes. (laughs) Thank you, John, for this earlier. This actual, as I call it, rejuvenation of the human person through grace, where grace makes real contact with us, was rejected by the reformers in the 16th century. It's too much to believe. How could God go that far? How could God reach into the muck of humanity and redeem that? So we will get into that. And as I mentioned earlier, it contrasts with often what's called forensic justification or uh, juridical justification, the Protestant theologians advance that you are deemed justified, like a stamp on USDA inspected me. There's no internal rejuvenation of nature. You are just declared just. I would add that, that there is a point of the spear for us as Catholics too. It challenges what I call a dry formalism that can creep into our spiritual lives. Namely, if I comply with obligations, I'm okay. And there's no interior life. There's no radical conversion of heart. I'm just complying with the manual. But it doesn't touch me where I live. We can all fall prone to that. And, And think that well, if I go to confession, and, and again, going to confession is a wonderful thing, uh, and go to Mass on Sundays, uh, I'm kind of done. I, you know, I'll, you know, I'll pick things up, but if I comply, uh, I'm fine. Now, I'm not arguing against these spiritual practices at all. I think they're wonderful, and they help us in a real way. But it's this conversion of heart, this interior life that all the saints talk about, And this interior life is what sustains the good habits, by the way. 
I know parents struggle with this when they send their children away for college and the kids stop going to Mass. They went to Mass with me every Sunday, uh, but they go to college and they fall away. One of the reasons, I think, is an interior life of the child, and student, was never really developed. Connecting the feet with the heart. If you make it about obligations only, I can rationalize obligations. I can't rationalize, rationalize away my heart. So there are lots of implications to this, uh, but um, the emphasis for this class uh, was to set up these categories to help our understanding and our spiritual life of nature and grace, how they interplay, and how the, we all have a theology of grace that we might have explicit or not that we operate out of. And it's important that this is really the foundation for everything that's going to follow in the course of that we are called to this real union with God, that grace makes real contact with us. <laughs> it's time we wrap up. <laughs> But before we uh, close for the night, are there any comments or questions? <laughs> yes. So the question was, is there a chicken and egg problem here of do we struggle and then grace comes, or does grace come first and guide us through that struggle? And the answer is yes. <laughs> 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 but in, in fairness... Uh, God's action is always first. We will get to this in class two and in class four, but the theological answer is God stimulates in us a free action by his grace, under his impulse. And our human freedom is respected, and the gift of grace is respected in that process. But in terms of the spiritual life, uh, we struggle in grace. We're, we're never really uh, outside the, the purview of God's action in our lives. And we might think we are isolated, but as we'll see in class four, when we talk about Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who lived a life of darkness, uh, that God in some ways was closest to her in that darkness. And you mentioned St. Teresa of Avila and even St. John of the Cross and the other Spanish mystics. This, this spirituality of absence is something that we will spend some time on. Well, good. Thank you, everyone, for coming out today. We'll see you next week. <laughs>